So let us continue. I introduced this concept of OPE. Let me write it a bit uh, in a different, more condensed form. So OX1 or 2 of O1 of x O2 of y, so this is equal to a sum of uh, over k, f1 to k. And then here I said there's going to be an infinite series, and so I can write this series as a, I can introduce here some notation for this infinite series, so it's some operator. Let me denote it p, x minus y, which, and derivatives, which acts on the operator OK, insert it at Y. So it's an infinite series in, uh, in DY. Uh, and uh, as I said, the coefficients of this series can be all, uh, at least in principle, determined by matching with a three-point function. So we will, we will draw some pictures and uh, we will denote this OPE by uh, this sort of uh, this sort of picture that we take the two operators O1 and O2 and we fuse them. So sometimes one uses this terminology fusing, fusion um, instead of OPE. And we replace it by a sum of our operators K. And so this, li this line here, which it denotes not just operator OK, but also all of its descendants, all of its derivatives. And so, uh, so we have this equation that uh, this with f1 to k, uh, this formula, it has to be equal uh, to uh, really the correlation function where I insert the two operators 1, 2, and k. I can compute this three-point correlation function by using the OPE. So uh, one comment, I, I think I let me stress it once again, is that um, if you're familiar with two-dimensional CFT, of course you're familiar with the OPE also in the two-dimensional context, but there is going to be one uh, change of emphasis in, in our story. So in two-dimensional CFT, uh, one often pays uh, primary attention only to the most singular terms in the OPE. So if you remember, for example, in, uh, so in 2D, one discusses the OPE of the stress tensor operator. So let me remind you. So one writes equations like dz t0, and here, uh, so here there are, there are several terms. There's the first term, uh, c over 2 divided by uh, z to the fourth. And then there are terms uh, proportional to t divided by z squared. And another term proportional to dt divided by z. You know, with some coefficients, which I don't remember. And then there are infinitely many other terms in the OPE. Uh, and uh, you hardly ever uh, see those terms in two-dimensional CFT literature because the way, for example, the way this OP is used often in, in, in textbooks is, is to derive the Verasor algebra. There is some contour argument, if you remember. And for this contour argument, it's important. The, the singular terms of the OP are important but these subleading terms are not important. So that's why they are not mentioned. Uh, so for us, all terms in this OPE are going to be important. And, uh, and the reason is that if you only keep the leading most singular terms in the OPE, then uh, you can describe, so this is my, this is my uh, cell phone. You can describe the correlation function only in the limit where these two points are uh, close to each other. But for us, it's going to be important to describe the correlation function also at finite separation. So this is something that I already mentioned. So if, if you include all of these terms 
in the OPE, then you can determine the correlation function, not only in the limit when one, when the points one and two are uh, infinitesimally close to each other, but also at finite separation. So as, as, as I already mentioned, uh, the radius of convergence of this uh, series, if provided that you uh, use this OPE to compute, so let me say it once again. So, so suppose that you, you have uh, endpoint correlation function, O1 of x1, O2 of x2, and here you have some other fields, sum of Oy, xi. So you have x1 here, x2 here, and then there are other points here where something is inserted. And you want to compute this correlation function using the OPE. So you, you, you say, okay, this correlation function is equal to the sum f1 to k, uh, this operator p x1 minus x2 uh, d x2, acting on the operator ok. And here you have n minus one point correlation function. You have ok of x2 and all these other operators, you know, the same ones. So when is this expansion going to converge? It will converge, so I'm not going to explain it, but let me state the result. It will converge provided that x1 minus x2 is smaller than the maximum uh, of the distances x2 minus x, no, minimum. Minimum of the distances x2 minus all these other points xi. So provided that a point x1 is closer to x2 than all the other points, then this is going to converge. And this is going to be crucial, that the OPE provides the description not only at, in the infinitesimal limit, but also at finite separation. Any questions about that? Okay. And so, uh, okay, now in the language of pictures, I can already tell you what is going to be the main idea of this conformal bootstrap. Uh, the main idea is going to be uh, to take a four-point correlation function so we are going to take a four-point correlation function, and we are going to, so, O1, O2, O3, O4. And we are going to say that we can compute this, this uh, four-point correlation function in two possible ways. We can take uh, the OP of points O1, O2, and O3, O4. So we are going to compute this correlation function as, in the language of the diagrams that I reproduced, it's going to be, a, uh, this diagram, so there's going to be sum over k of these things. Now, let me make sure that everyone understands what this diagram means. It means that I uh, take the points O1, O2, I replace them by an infinite sum of uh, these differential operators acting on operator OK. So let me write, this is important, so I'm going to write it in detail. So this is equal to sum of P X12, this is just the difference, uh, DX2 OK at the point X2. And then analogously O34, so here I forgot, F12 K. And analogously, I replace uh, I replace three and four as well. So F three, four K P X three, uh, X three, four G X four. And here there's operator OK of X four. So in in principle, you have a sum over k here, and you have a sum over k prime here. 
But now we have to compute the two-point function, OK of x2, OK of x4. And as, as we said, the two-point function is diagonal. So only two operators with equal uh, dimensions and spins can have non-zero two-point correlation function. So in practice, OK, in practice it means that the operator OK will only have non-zero correlation function with itself. So you can, you can diagonalize the correlation function. So, so that's why we have a double sum over k, k prime, which collapses to just a single sum over k. And so we reduced, we reduced the four-point correlation function to a sum of two-point correlation functions acted upon by these differential operators and OP coefficients multiplying it. So this is a... <coughs> Yeah, this OK are primary operators. Uh, well, if this happens, then you should uh, diagonalize, you should uh, do a linear transformation to, to make sure. So first of all, uh, you know, generically, if you have an interacting conformal field theory, then uh, you are not going to have two operators of the same dimension, because all dimensions are going to be different. It's only in very special uh, theories, like in free theories, you will have operators which are not identical, but operator uh, dimensions are identical. So in that case, you have to do a diagonalization. So, two remarks. First of all, uh, this equation solves for us the problem of computing four-point correlation function. So I, I told you that if you know all dimensions and all, spi and all spins and all OPE coefficients, then you know everything. Well, here is an example. So if I know these OPE coefficients and the dimensions of the operators which occur in the OPE, then I can compute also the four-point function by doing this infinite sum. Uh, and, uh, and this sum is going to converge. So that's the first point. The second point is that this expansion also gives us a constraint, also gives us a constraint on uh, these numbers, on Fs. The point is that I can now do, I can compute the same four-point correlation function in the opposite order. I can do the OPE of points 1, 3, and 2, 4. And then here there's going to be some of our other operators, k prime. And it's the same correlation function, so the two expansions should agree. But that they agree is not going to be automatic. Meaning that if you take just some random, uh, if you take just some random numbers, uh, delta k for the separators that you exchange, and some random numbers for the OP coefficients, you compute the four-point function using this way or using that way, you're not going to get the same function. It's only for very special choices of uh, OPE coefficients and the dimensions that you are going to get this uh, agreement between different channels. So, uh, in uh, uh, you know when so these diagrams they look a little bit as Feynman diagrams, although they are not Feynman diagrams. And so, just like in Feynman diagrams, we speak about S channel and T channel. Uh, also here, we talk about uh, direct channel and the crossed channel for the OPE. So there is this terminology. And all channels should agree. So this is, uh, so this is the, the conformal bootstrap. So conformal bootstrap uh, says that, uh, first of all, uh, all channels <coughs> 
for all four point functions should agree. And this gives you a constraint on allowed uh, deltas and Fs. <clears throat> so this is clear. Uh, what is less clear is whether uh, how strong this constraint is. And so uh, the second the second point is that it's basically all there is. I'm, I'm going to discuss this, yeah. No, it's, it's possible to find positions where all, uh, uh, where both channels are going to give convergent expansions. I, I'm going to show this in a second. So, uh, so let me focus on this point. Uh, so, um, so in some zeroth approximation, in some zeroth approximation, basically if you have a set of deltas and Fs, which satisfies this constraint, then you basically have a CFT. So you have a consistent theory. Or you have 99% of a consistent theory. So that there is some subtlety here. So there may be some additional constraints there may be some additional constraints that sometimes you need to impose, but uh, basically already in the 70s, so when, when people first were playing with this idea, uh, they, in particular Polyakov, Polyakov when he was thinking about this idea in the 70s, he said that, well, uh, you know, if you, find, if you find a system of deltas and depths which satisfy this constraint, well, this is your theory. There is no other constraint. There's no other obvious constraint that you should impose for consistency. So basically, that's it. If you, you should accept this as a valid conformal field theory. And so uh, if, you, if you take this point of view, then classifying the problem of classifying conformal field theories in any number of dimensions is basically reduced to the problem of classifying solutions to, to, this, to this equation. Any questions about that? I'm sorry? In two dimensions. So I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. <clears throat> yeah, so, so that's precisely why I said it's 99%. So, um, so in two dimensions, it's known that uh, there are extra constraints. which are known under the name of modular invariance. And basically what this, uh, what this amounts to is that you can sometimes uh, take a conformal field theory and, and you take a subsector of conformal field theory which is completely closed under operator product expansion for some symmetry reasons. So from the point of view of conformal bootstrap, Everything is fine. Conformal bootstrap equation was satisfied for, uh, for the original CFT and it's satisfied also for this subsector. 
One example is, you know, uh, the, the stress tensor operator in any two-dimensional conformal field theory has a closed to PE with itself. So if you just truncate the conformal field theory to the stress tensor in two dimensions, then a conformal booster equation is satisfied. But that's not a full CFT. That's not a full CFT. That's a truncation of a CFT. And uh, the way you go, the way you see it is uh, by looking at the modular invariance constraints. So I'm not going to explain what it is, but for those who know modular invariance. Uh, so modular invariance tells you how you should put together various sectors of the theory which are closed under OPE to get a full consistent theory. Uh, so, uh, but basically, you know, if you already solved conformal bootstrap and you found all consistent sectors, then how to put this together uh, in, is in a sense a simpler problem. That's why I'm saying it's already 99% of, of, of the thing. Uh, so in higher dimensions, the number of allowed truncations is presumably even less. Because for example, the stress tensor operator in higher dimensions does not form a closed sector by itself, unlike in two dimensions. So probably the only truncations you're allowed in high dimensions are the ones which are, you know, justified in terms of some global symmetry. Uh, so once again, uh, you know, if you do conformal bootstrap, you might be able to solve not the full CFT, but just a subsector. And then you should ask, well, can you, allow, can you extend it to an even bigger theory? But again, I consider it as a, as a 1%. So the modular, modular invariance and unfortunately in high dimensions, so in two dimensions there is this modular invariance constraint which very, which very easily allows you to complete this 1%. But in high dimensions the modular invariance is, uh, is not, um, not as nice because uh, the modular invariance constraint cannot be expressed in high dimensions in terms of the uh, CFT data in flat space. There was some other question? Yes. Yes, uh, uh, that's an important question. It's enough to consider only four-point functions provided that you consider all possible four-point functions. Because um, there are various ways to see it. There's various ways to see it. So one way to see it, uh, perhaps the, the nicest way, is to think of this conformal bootstrap uh, constraint as a sort of condition for OPE associativity. So if you, if you take the OPE of one and the two, and then you take the OPE of three, then it's the same as doing things in the opposite order. And this fourth operator of four, serves for you to project the result of the of doing the repetitive OPE on some particular channel. And uh, if you do it, if you view it this way, then it's clear that by considering possible four-point functions, you already enforce OPE associativity. And then by going, uh, and then all high point functions are going to be automatic. But again, uh, yes, so, but, uh, so, This condition, which one? This condition. Okay, so what's gonna happen is that this correlation function, this correlation function are going to be smooth functions apart from you know, some coincident points. So if you find an open region uh, where they agree, uh, I mean, by analyticity, they basically have to agree everywhere. So I'm not sure it answers your question, so. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes. So, so basically, what's going to happen is that for any correlation function, any endpoint correlation function, there's going to be some uh, finite region of possible point configurations where you can impose this conformal bootstrap constraint in a way that both sides converge. And what I'm saying is that morally that's, that's enough. It's enough that there should be at least some finite region where both expansions agree where both expansions converge and agree. Then the rest follows by analyticity. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. You can consider a one for, yeah. Uh, Sometimes, yes, yeah, it depends. Uh, yeah, you, you should consider a possible permutation. Okay, so um, so philosophically, this is very satisfactory because, uh, you know, yeah, so we have equations which are uh, mathematically well-defined equations. So these are equations for uh, convergent quantities. Uh, you don't have to worry about uh, renormalization or anything, all these things that uh, we usually worry about when we do quantum field theory. Uh, so in principle, uh, you know, if somebody gives you deltas and f's, you can put all this in the computer. You can sum the series. You can uh, you can plot the function. So it's um, if you're mathematically minded, then this is very satisfactory. So the only uh, non-satisfactory thing is that how do you actually solve these equations? You know, so that's. Uh, this was the advance of of the recent years. Is that finally. Uh, we have, uh, we discovered a method which allows us to solve these equations, at least numerically. Right. Uh, so I'm going to, to discuss this method, and uh, I, I'd like to mention straight from the start is that we don't yet understand analytically why this method works. But given that numerically it works so nicely, uh, you know, there is basically little doubt that sooner or later this uh, understanding is going to be achieved. So not only, uh, not only for the first time in uh, many, many years, we have a method which works to solve this problem, but also we have a clear uh, a clear way to go. We should just understand better why this method works, and then you know, we are, we are certain to learn more about this problem. So that's uh, that's a very nice uh, uh, time in in, uh, in in the in in the history of this problem. So we are kind of on the on the crucial junction. So. Um, so the next thing that I have to discuss. Is uh, goes under the name of conformal blocks. So what is the what is the complication with this with this problem with this problem? Uh, especially if you are a two-dimensional person, then uh, you know what are um, what what are the thing what are the complicated things? So in two dimensions, there is this nice uh, nice separation between z and z bars, and you can basically uh, forget about z bars. You can think only in terms of z's. Uh, 
So this is holomorphic anti-holomorphic factorization. So in high dimensions, this is not possible. So you have to work with all x's. And uh, there's a lot of ten tensor algebra involved. So there are lots of x mu's uh, out there. And so it's, uh, it may look a bit intimidating to have to deal with all these tensors. And uh, so the first thing you have to do is uh, you know, to, to simplify this tensor algebra as much as possible. So th that's what I'm going to explain now, how, how we deal with this. You have to develop some technical tools in order to, to, to make the problem manageable. So, uh, so this goes under the name of conformal blocks. Uh, so uh, let me let me consider a four-point correlation function, and now I'm going to do some simplifying assumptions. So before, until now, I was uh, you know I was writing the equations uh, as if my operators were scalars, but in fact uh, you, you know it, this was just to save some notation. Uh, but now I'm really going to focus uh, to the case when the correlation function I'm considering is a correlation function of four uh, scalar operators. It is really a scalar operator. So I'm going to focus on that case. And moreover, I'm going to consider the case where these four operators are identical. So this is going to be the simplest case. So I'm considering correlation function phi x1, uh, phi x2, phi x3, phi x4, the same operator. So to extend what I'm going to say to non-identical scalars is possible and has been done. To extend it to the case of non-identical scalars is also possible, but much more complicated and has been done only partially and uh, uh, has not yet been implemented numerically in the numerical analysis. So this is kind of an open problem. So this correlation function, uh, of four scalar operators, it can be uh, expressed in the following form. There is uh, some correlation, some function GUV, and uh, in the denominator, I have x12 uh, to the power 2 delta phi and x34 to the power 2 delta phi. So xij is xi minus xj. And these u's and v's are the cross ratios. So u is equal to um, uh, x12 squared, x34 squared, divided by x13 squared, x24 squared. And v is equal uh, to the same expression as u, provided that you interchange points uh, 1 and 3. So this is known. This is exactly the same as in two dimensions. So the four-point correlation function can be written up to this uh, factor, can be written as a function of cross ratios. So these cross ratios u and v, when you apply a conformal transformation, they are left invariant. And so this correlation function written in this form transforms covariantly under the conformal transformations. So this is just conformal kinematics. Any questions about that? But now, uh, I already told you uh, that there is a different way to write this correlation function, namely by using the OPE. I could compute the same correlation function by using the OPE and doing it like this. So this means that I can compute, so this function GUV, which from the point of view of conformal kinematics is arbitrary. If I use the OPE, I can actually compute this function GUV, right? So this function GUV uh, is going to be computable as a sum over all k's, the same k's as there, 
there's going to be a f 1 to k, well, 1, 2 here is the same, so phi phi k uh, squared, because I'm applying the OPU two times, times some other function, let me call it g uh, delta k lk of uv. So, so where, where does this equation come from? So the, the OPE coefficients f5 phi phi k, these are just these things, f1 to k and f3 for k. Now here, uh, I was talking about this differential operators acting on the, on the two-point function OK, OK. So what I'm saying now is that if you were to make this computation, if you were to do this computation, uh, then at the end of all the algebra, which is considerable algebra, you are supposed to get that uh, everything should collapse. So th this one term and this sum, there are infinite, infinitely many terms, but each term and this sum should collapse to some function of cross ratios again. You know this, you know this uh, before you even do the computation that in the end it should collapse. And this function is called conformal block. Is this clear? So this function is a conformal block and this function, it depends only on the dimension and spin of the exchanged operator K. So it's completely fixed by conformal symmetry. So if you know this function, then, and if you know the, the OP coefficients, then you compute this function GUV. So uh, let's, uh, Yes. Because, uh, yeah, I, I'm, yeah, you, you are right. I should be a bit more specific about choices that I make. So I, I, I chose all my fields to be real, to be Hermitian. And if I do this choice, then uh, the OP coefficients are going to be real. So there is no, in a unitary theory. So I'm, uh, so I'm, I'm choosing here that, uh, my, so let's suppose that my theory is unitary. And uh, all operators, I choose the real basis of operators, uh, Hermitian basis of operators. Then uh, the, These OP coefficients are real. And this needs to be shown, but one can show this. So think about the easing model uh, or, or about the phi to the fourth theory. This is anyway, it's good to keep it in mind, you know. All fields in that theory, uh, I mean, it's a real theory. So all operators in the theory are made out of phi and its derivatives. Now, what I'm saying is that uh, if you go to the critical point, you go to long distances, and you measure three-point functions, and these are the OP coefficients f, i, j, k. Since everything is real, it's clear that these OP coefficients are also going to be real, at least in this case. But there is a large class of theories where this is also going to be true. So, um, so now we are facing the following. Uh, the, we are facing the following problem. We we need to compute. We need to get some handle on these conformal blocks. So, if we know the conformal blocks, then we can impose. Uh, we can impose this condition. This. Uh, 
crossing symmetry condition. Because this uh, crossing symmetry, it, it means that we should interchange the values of u and v. So the, the crossing symmetry will say that uh, this formula has to be equal uh, to the same formula when I interchange points 1 and 3. Because if I interchange here points 1 and 3, then, um, you know, on, on the left-hand side nothing changes, so the right-hand side also has to be invariant. And so this is equal to uh, GVU divided by X13, uh, no, X23, sorry, to the power 2 delta phi, X34, X14, uh, to the power to delta phi. And uh, so what this means is that I get the equation that G uv is equal uh, to u over v to the power delta phi uh, G v u. So, uh, okay, I'm being a bit quick here. So in general case, so this constraint, which I call crossing symmetry constraint, it requires you to do the OP in one channel, do the OP in the other channel, and then compare the two expansions. But here, we are in a better situation. In this particular case that I'm considering, we are in a better situation because we are dealing with a four-point function of four identical scalars. So all channels are the same. Because meaning that the, the operators that I'm going to get when I expand in the cross channel are the same operators that I'm getting when I then I expanding in the direct channel. So the, the crossing symmetry constraint just is expressed as a certain constraint on the function GUV, which is the one that I derived. Is this clear? And so you already see the pattern. So I impose that GUV is expandable in terms of conformal blocks with these coefficients, which are unknown. That's the first step. Second step is that I demand that the result of the expansion satisfies this equation written here. This is, for this particular four-point function, the crossing symmetry constraint. And in order to impose it, we have to know something about the conformal blocks. We have to understand these conformal blocks. Okay. So uh, let's... Uh, Let me draw one more, one more picture here. So, yeah, here I was, you know, writing this uh, as, a, as a function of u and v, but, uh, you know, sometimes it's, uh, it's convenient to... So in this form, this equation is uh, really uh, applicable for any points x1, x2, x3, and 4. But you can also view, view it slightly differently. And this is usually uh, the approach we also take in, in two dimensions. You can say, well, I'm going to use freedom under conformal transformations to move these points around, and I'm going to fix them to some particular positions. So I can, I can uh, usually the way people do it is that they, they fix the point x1 to 0. Uh, they, put this, they send the point x4 to infinity then uh, x3 maybe you, you said to one particular point, you can call it one, and then you're left with just one point x2. So this is what we usually, uh, usually do in, um, in two dimensions. But this can also be done in, in any number of dimensions. So I can, in any number of dimensions, I can put the point x1 at zero, 
I can uh, take the point x3 at 1. So x4 goes to infinity. Now I'm, I'm left with the point x2. And the point x2, I still have rotation invariance around this axis. So I can use this rotation invariance in order to, point, to put the point x2 in the plane of the blackboard. <clears throat> and so this means, you know, since I have uh, my, my blackboard is two-dimensional, it means that any four, so the four-point function in any number of dimensions has the freedom of two real variables, <coughs> right? And this is exactly what I have here. So I have three, I have two real variables, u and v, which are in this, uh, in this frame, they are, be, they are related to the coordinates of the point x2 in this plane. And actually, uh, you know, this plane is two-dimensional, so I'm, I'm allowed to pick whatever coordinates I want in this plane. In two dimensions, we, we pick the complex coordinate z. And in two dimensions, it's particularly nice because uh, everything is holomorphic and anti-holomorphic factorized. But I can also pick this coordinate z in any number of dimensions, also in d dimensions. So let me do this. I'm going to use this coordinate z and the complex co conjugate coordinate z bar uh, also in, uh, in d dimensions. Of course, uh, things are no longer going to be factorized in z and z bar. So uh, as you will see, there are going to be some equations which are going to involve both z and z bar, unlike in 2D. But I can do this. And so uh, if, I, if I write it like this, then uh, my four-point correlation function becomes a function of z and z bar. So if you look at uh, u and v, then u is going to become z, uh, z, z bar, because x12 is, or maybe I should write just z squared, right? Absolute value of z squared, because x12 is z squared, and here I send x4 to infinity. So um, all the other factors go to 1. x13 is 1. And v becomes 1 minus z squared. In this particular, for this particular choice of coordinates. So then I, I have then g z z z z bar is equal to the sum f k squared g k of z z bar. And then this equation, this equation star, I can write as. Uh, Uh, I can write as, let me write it like this, uh, 1 minus z, 1 minus uh, z bar to the power delta phi, g of z, z bar has to be equal uh, to z, z bar to the power delta phi g e of 1 minus z, 1 minus z bar. So basically, the crossing transformation is the transformation which interchanges x1 and x3. And so what was z becomes 1 minus z. So the crossing transformation changes z to 1 minus z and z bar to 1 minus z bar. And here I can, uh, now I can answer, now I can answer the question. So there was a question asked whether I can find 
uh, a, a frame in which both uh, OPE expansions are going to be convergent. And here I, I clearly see that there is such a frame. So because if I, if this is my choice of points, x1, x2, x3, x4, then the OPE expansion for uh, x1, x2 is going to converge provided that the point x2 is closer to x1 than any other point. So it's going to converge in this, in this circle, in the circle of radius one around x1. And in the other channel, x2, x3, it's going to converge in this uh, circle, in the circle of radius one around the point x3. And so you see that there is this whole region there's this whole region in which both OP expansions are going to converge. And so we can impose uh, the crossing symmetry constraint by demanding that at least in this region, the two expansions should agree. Yes? Actually, I don't understand the question, sorry. What's the U channel? Ah, the third channel, you mean? Well, the third channel is not going to converge for this, uh, for this choice of points. You have to choose, you, you have to put points differently in order to make the third channel converge. No. No, no, you cannot, uh, you cannot have, uh, you cannot have a region where both three channels converge simultaneously, I think. That's, yeah, you should compare, you should compare one to two, then in some other region, two to three, uh, when you need to do it. Here we don't need to do it because since we are dealing with a four point function of four identical scalars, uh, actually, the moment you compare the, 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 this channel 1, 2, and 2, 3, you're basically done. You don't need to, to do anything else. So, uh, so let me recap. I, I told you that, uh, at least in this particular case, the conformal bootstrap equation takes form of this uh, equation, on, which has to be satisfied by four-point correlation function. And in order to impose this equation, we have to expand the four-point correlation function in conformal blocks. So I already defined for you the conformal blocks. And now my next task is going to be tomorrow uh, to tell you how you actually compute these conformal blocks in practice. I think I'll stop here.